Hey World Civilizations, Mr. Lasseter here with you, and in this video we're looking at British Imperialism. Uh, quite a few video goals. Some of these you're going to really have to listen for because it might not be directly in your notes. You'll have to listen to the sound of my voice. Uh, so take a look at the questions. Uh, quite a lot of vocabulary, so make sure you get that written down as well. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first of all, we may want to think about what was British imperialism, where was it, um, what did it look like. Uh, and that's tough to say. Uh, first of all, it was all around the world. Uh, the Americas, Africa, uh, Asia, and Australia. Uh, the saying was that the, Brit the, the sun never set on the British Empire, and that was certainly true. It was daytime somewhere in the British Empire at all times. Um, but the level of British control over their colonies around the world really did vary from place to place. Some places pretty much were self-governed. Uh, in other places, Britain had direct control or complete control of the colony. Um, for example, in Burma, British abolished the monarchy there and installed its own government over that region. Uh, and Burma's in Southeast Asia. or well, South Asia. Um, in some places, they had indirect rules, so they would leave the local rulers in charge, but the British would basically control them, like in Nigeria and West Africa. Uh, in exchange for cooperation, they would leave the local leaders in charge. Um, and in some places, this changed. For example, in India, we'll see uh, kind of a less direct rule change to direct rule as a result of resistance. So what led to uh, British expansion? What caused it? Well, we've been looking at these causes already, so they shouldn't be too new to you, but listen to some of the examples I'll give. Uh, the first one is, of course, industrialization, obtaining raw materials and selling finished products. That was um, something that Britain, being the first country to industrialize and, and the most powerful of these, that's what they wanted. Um, an example of this would be India, for example. Uh, India produced a great deal of cotton, which was then brought to uh, the United Kingdom uh, and, and made into finished textiles, and they would sell those textiles back to people in India or around the empire, anywhere they had. Um, for example, it was also uh, forbidden for a time for people in, Indi in India to buy their textiles local made. They had to buy them from the British. There were also technological changes. Better ships, beginning with the clipper ship and then eventually steamships, um, that led to better communication around the British Empire. It made it much faster for people to get around. And, of course, if you can move from one place to another or move your troops from one place to another, you can ex exert uh, more direct control. Uh, communication even got better once telegraph wires are laid under oceans. Uh, Transatlantic cables are laid. Uh, cables in the Indian Ocean are laid to send messages around the world fair, uh, very quickly. Of course, in our last video, we looked at cultural beliefs, religious beliefs, racist pseudoscience, uh, competition between countries of uh, as they fought to show that their culture was superior. All these things also led to British expansion. In the 19th century, there are also a lot of political changes. Um, European power shifts in the 19th century, all, all the way back to the time of Napoleon, allows Britain uh, to expand their empire. For example, when Napoleon invades the Netherlands, Britain takes the uh, opportunity to take over South Africa. Uh, when the French are weakened, British take, Britain takes the opportunity to expand their colonies in India. Um, and so that's going to be one of the things that we see is, as Europe is trying to strike a balance of power, Britain is industrializing and able to expand. And lastly, of course, Britain wanted to expand just for strategic advantages. They want supply posts and trading posts, as, as many as they can all around the world. Uh, for example, it's much easier to go from Britain to India if you can stop over and refuel or resupply um, in British South Africa. So now I want to take a look at three examples uh, that we see um, in the British Empire, three different places that, that Britain controls, and we can look at look for some differences in these. So first, let's start with British India. And again, if you want more in-depth information on this, take a look at Mr. Guilford's video on British India in your additional focus area. Um, British India 
or Britain control, uh, begins to control parts of India around the 1700s. And they really do so through a company known as the British East India Company, um, which is uh, like a business, like you could think of any other, just a massive business uh, that was responsible for all trade uh, in India. Uh, and the British East India Company really comes to power while the Mughal Empire, which had been in control in India for hundreds of years, was really disintegrating. It was falling apart. And the British East India Company used uh, um, disagreements between local leaders to really gain more of a foothold. And you can actually see basically the region that the company ruled over in this map on the right. Um, with the company coming in, Britain brought in Western education um, and Western uh, uh, culture into the region as well. Um, they also imposed their rule by employing uh, local Indians in the military. We called those sepoys. And in 1857, the sepoys, after numerous disagreements and misunderstandings, uh, basically rebelled against the British East India Company rule. Uh, they slaughtered local uh, Europeans. Um, they, they fought basically to try to get rid of the British East India Company um, and, and establish self-rule. Of course, the British sent their mighty military in and crushed the rebellion. Um, the local Indian population referred to this as the Indian Rebellion of 1857. Uh, and the result of this was Britain basically saying that the British East India Company was not keeping the peace, and that they now, given new communications technologies, they could rule directly over, over India. And so as a result of the Sepoy Rebellion, which you see in this picture, uh, the Britain uh, establishes direct control. And we call this time of direct control the British Raj. It lasts from 1857 all the way until Indian independence. Now, this rebellion was a source of unity for uh, many people in India. They saw it as people coming together against this imperial power. Um, and part of those ideas of wanting freedom and wanting imperial power came from the Western education that was actually brought into India by the British. So a little bit of irony there that many of the reforms and educations brought in actually gave rise to Indian nationalism. Now, um, and this is the first Indian National Congress, which was established in 1885, and they would push for independence and eventually succeed uh, in the 1940s. Uh, but Britain, one thing, we, er, Britain referred to India as the jewel in the crown of their empire. And that was because India, as I said earlier, uh, had a lot of people, it had a lot of uh, raw materials, and it had uh, the markets for British goods. And it really would um, develop uh, would create a lot of wealth for Britain. Uh, it had actual jewels that it would export, and cotton, and many other uh, products, which really did fuel the British Empire and made Britain quite wealthy. Now, a second example I want to look at is British South Africa. Um, it originally was colonized by the Dutch, or people from the Netherlands, um, white Europeans, um, in the Cape, what was called the Cape Colony around the Cape of Good Hope. But the British took control in 1795 once Na uh, Napoleon had invaded the Netherlands. Basically, they realized that they needed to control this territory, or they felt they needed to control it, just in case France tried to do anything fishy uh, in, in India. They wanted to have a very strategic location. Of course, the British then send settlers there, um, and they find that South Africa has quite a lot of riches, especially when they discover diamond mines in the region, uh, which is uh, where we, we see the De Beers Consolidated Company uh, develop a monopoly over diamonds in this region. Uh, but they also did discover gold in the region. Uh, and so much of British expansion was fueled by this wealth of diamonds and gold. One multimillionaire who also was responsible for British expansion not only in South Africa, but in Africa in general, was a guy named Cecil Rhodes, uh, who actually had wealth from uh, his, from actually diamonds and gold. Um, he will wield a great deal of power being um, uh, within South Africa until he kind of does some uh, not so uh, uh, well looked upon things and he eventually falls from, from grace. 
Um, but there was also resistance in 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 South Africa to the British, um, not just from the locals. Uh, for example, there was the war. This is Cecil Rhodes. Sorry, I forgot to show him your uh, show you that image. Um, they fought a a war with the local Zulu kingdom, um, which uh, was kind of an anti imperialist war. These uh, local native South Africans, uh, the Zulu, fought uh, brutally against uh, the the Dutch and the British um, in this region, eventually losing to the superior uh, military might of the British. Um, Oh, sorry, I went too far. But the British also ended up actually having to fight the previous Dutch settlers. So they faced resistance from a lot of different groups. They eventually reached peace with Dutch settlers when they create the Union of South Africa in 1910, basically giving uh, South Africa its independence. However, they leave the minority white population in charge. They create laws uh, as they leave that creates an all-white government where only whites can vote in South Africa. And that remained the case until the 1990s. And the third example is probably the one you've been waiting for, uh, and one that is different from the other two that we see, and that is British Australia. Uh, the British began exploring Australia all, all the way back in the 1760s. Uh, early settlement basically displaced indigenous peoples. Diseases wiped out. Estimates are up to maybe 80% of aborigines in Australia and Maori in New Zealand. Um, and the British primarily used uh, uh, Australia as a penal colony. So they shipped their convicts there to perform hard labor. They would either work for free settlers who were already there, or they would work on government projects, things like building railroads or building... Uh, um, well, just regular roads in, in the region. Um, but the, the movement of convicts to Australia ends about 1850 uh, when gold is discovered in Australia. And so that led to a lot of new settlers from all over Asia, but also the rest of the British Empire, coming to Australia uh, in search of riches. Uh, and that is where we kind of see the, especially um, Europeans moving to Australia, where we actually see kind of the modern... Uh, way we think of Australia really develop. Um, once, uh, just like in South Africa we saw, there's actually a policy called the White Australia Policy um, that restricts any non-white European immigration to Australia uh, at a certain point. Um, it was one of Britain's most successful settler colonies, but like India, like South Africa, we also see um, kind of some brutal... Uh, treatment of natives in the region in favor of white European uh, uh, settlers. All right, guys, that's it. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Uh, make sure that you can answer all these video goals questions and that you are able to define the vocabulary. Uh, you have a wonderful day.